Welcome to Book to Where Two Guys Tell You About the Books They're Reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snudden. This week, a um, little bit of a special episode. This is one of our Patreon picks um, for Patreon subscribers above some ridiculous level. Um, and, and in exchange for all that ridiculous amounts of money, um, we allow uh, Patreon members to pick a book that we review. So this week, it's going to be more of like a review slash discussion. And, and maybe after we go through the synopsis and stuff, we'll talk a little bit more about what you can expect. But we are going to be talking about All the Beautiful Sinners by Stephen Graham Jones. This came up on uh, our last holiday episode, I believe. Was it the last holiday episode? Yeah, it was. And yeah. then we talked about how what a shame it was that we've read um, quite a bit of Stephen Graham Jones and never read uh, really, I mean, up until very recently, it seems like his best known book. So good friend of the podcast, Misty Bennett, um, picked that for our review this week. And she is joining us. Hello, Misty. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the discussion today. Very cool. And then alongside her, other longtime friend of the podcast, Jesse. Jesse, say hello to everybody. Hey, it's good to be here. So, um, I, I mean, we'll probably talk about a little bit about our uh, individual experiences with Stephen Graham Jones, or at least uh, for our two um, guest hosts. But uh, first, uh, a very uh, quick um, synopsis for All the Beautiful Sinners. When a fellow officer is killed while searching the vehicle of a Native American... Deputy Sheriff Jimmy Doe discovers that the killer, dubbed the Tin Man, has also murdered at least two other people and is targeting another, a situation that prompts Doe to launch a relentless investigative road trip across Texas. I'm not sure <laughs> how accurately that describes this book. It's not inaccurate. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, that's 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 fair, but that's that's kind of like saying that, you know, Moby Dick is about a ship captain. <laughs> that's that's fair i mean there's more nuance to this book than is implied i yep, think in the correct. synopsis for sure <laughs> um, um i guess i guess we didn't do the author bio my apologies i, I kind of skipped right over it so i don't know Rob, if you want to livius is so excited to talk about this book mm -hmm. that he didn't even want to give acknowledgement to Stephen Graham Jones. Um, I, I, I will say that I pulled this off for author bio. This is a little bit of a flex. I pulled this author bio off of his new upcoming release. Uh, My heart is a chainsaw because the, the author bio that was tied to um, all beautiful sinners is real, real old. So this is an updated one. Um, Stephen Graham Jones has been an NEA fellowship recipient, won the 2020 Texas writer award the Independent Publisher Book Award for Multicultural Fiction and the Bram Stoker Award and has been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award and the World Fantasy Award. He is the Ivina Baldwin Professor of English at the University of Colorado Boulder and a really good friend of Jesse Lawrence. That's not on there. I just I added that last bit. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. We have read the same bio for him so many times that I'm going to challenge Rob to get 70% of that bio right, right now. Uh, uh, so, uh, I would say that he would, it would say something about, uh, that he was raised in Texas. He's black mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. Um, something about would wear pirate shirts a lot if he could. Mm -hmm. Um, and something about a sword? I don't know. Maybe I, there's would, a sword. I would say that's I would say that's seventy percent of the bio to which we have become accustomed over the course of uh, thirteen books. I think we've decided that we've we've talked about of his right thirteen. Yeah, this works is number thirteen. His... Yeah, so um, that is uh, for the most part that's everything I think you and I have read from him, right? With maybe a couple outside exceptions, a novella here or there. So um, I'd say we're we're familiar with half the catalog um but I'll, I'll turn it over to misty misty how uh, how familiar are you with stephen graham jones uh very familiar at this point i think i stumbled upon stephen graham jones back in 2005 uh due to being um acquainted with welcome to the velvet that forum I honestly cannot remember if All the Beautiful Sinners was the second or third book of Stevens that I read, um, but in between uh, Demon Theory and his uh, collection of stories, Bleed Into Me, I also read All the Beautiful Sinners the first time, and it made a wonderful impression, and I'm so excited that I just read it a second time um, for this recording, so... 
Love Steven. All right, Jesse, um, do some flexing, man. Uh, what, what's your relationship <laughs> like with Stephen Graham Jones? Um, I mean, yeah, Stephen and I are friends, and I've read probably, I mean, I've read everything that's been published for sure. As far as I know, sometimes I wonder if I'm missing a couple things here or there, but I'm pretty, pretty versed in his catalog. Yeah. Rob, anything you want to add to that? <laughs> About Jesse's relationship with Stephen Graham Jones. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I, you know what? While we were uh, introducing Misty and Jesse earlier, something occurred to me that um, I think is kind of funny because neither of them are technically podcasters. However, I think just based on the number of times you guys have appeared on this podcast, you've probably done more podcasts than people who have started podcasts. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, have is, you guys uh... thought about that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I like that idea. You're probably more established my... <laughs> than like... I'll put that on my resume yeah, going ex- <laughs> forward. Let's see. I'll just, if I can remember my LinkedIn password, I'll update that shit. <laughs> oh, that's going to open some doors. That's kicking doors open for you. Um, yeah, for sure. No, no, nothing says, uh, nothing impresses somebody like telling them, you host a podcast about books. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's I've gotten places with that. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to go too far into that. Um, what one thing I'll say about before we start the discussion about the book, one thing I'm going to say is that uh, we kind of decided that since this book is a really, really early release for Stephen Graham Jones, we're talking like. Uh, if 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 you gave it an age, it would probably be old enough to vote. It could have voted in 2020, I think. Um, we're not going to really worry too much about spoilers. Also, um, another reason for this, or or the reason that this is is helpful for us, is that like the story is pretty complicated, and explaining it how you read it is not going to be as entertaining or interesting as if we explain it as the overall story. So um, that's your spoiler warning. This is a, a very long established story that's been out there in the world for a long time. Um, and it is still available in your print form and also as an ebook. So uh, we are probably not going to worry too much about spoiling some stuff. So if that is something that concerns you, you have been warned. I'm worried you guys are going to spoil things for me about this book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's kick it off. This is going. Um, I guess I shouldn't say that this is going to be a complicated review, although it could be. Um, I do want to say that that this book is um, not just by me, um, but believed to be a very, very complex book and, and perhaps difficult to understand sometimes. So what I the reason I say that is even if you do listen and you catch some spoilers, if you want a challenging book, I don't think that should turn you off. From reading this one, even if we do go farther than we normally would go with our review, I think right. that's I think that's fair to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, that um, that being said, uh, Rob, let us know how this one starts. Oh man, so um, the you got your like this is definitely a prologue type of situation where there's a there's a bit of story that you don't really understand what's going on, but it kind of sets up um, like a format for later in the book, but the. The story starts out with a couple of kids who are, uh, it seems to be being held against their will um, in like a van and they're trying to escape. And um, in the in the process of escaping, you learn a little bit about um, uh, the, like the, the conditions that they're being held under. And uh, it just, it's kind of just creepy and, and it doesn't make sense in the moment, but um, it seems like this very, very bad man has taken these children, but also had some kind of, I don't know how much I want to say about it, but like a weird influence on them because it doesn't necessarily go as, as a normal escape would. And I don't know if Jesse or Missy wants to kind of throw some salt bay, some flavor on top of that, but like uh, some perspective on that, but that's kind of how it sets up the thing is like, obviously part of the story that's going to be important is that there's a guy who's, who's taking, children against their will oh man it's like one of the 
one of the best book openings I've read. I mean, seriously, it's it, it kind of grabs you right away and you're like, what the hell is going on? And then, like you said, it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go with with people being held captive, which just ramps up the curiosity. And then the stuff that they stumble upon, God damn, if that's not some like super cinematic, creepy imagery, I don't know what is. In fact, yeah, I think there was yeah. I don't know if it's on his on his blog or if it was on his old website, because back in the day when the Velvet first started, Stephen had a separate website that was Blue Monkey Land or something like that. But wh- wherever it was, there there was a, a picture of statues on on the website and that image is just kind of burned in my brain and it's like it really freaked me out when i saw that image i'm like holy shit like if you just like walked out into somewhere and and stumbled upon that they'd just be running around the other way yeah and then the whole idea that like it seems that so there's a boy and a girl kid and they're making an escape and the twist in this pre- the the prologue is that at the end it seems like the girl doesn't like is 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 on the side of the kidnapper um if i remember correctly yeah so like it, that's the twist in the prologue is like oh so like that that creeps you out because it's like oh this guy has gotten to her in a way where like she's she's bought into the weird shit that's going on yeah and that comes up later too i believe where where he says that it's it's always the girl who yep. who comes first Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. So that particular um, prologue takes place in 1991. I do want to give Stephen credit because dates helped a lot with reading this book because I could see where it'd be confusing. So it, it time jumps occasionally, um, not very frequently. It's not like an every other chapter thing. But the the bulk of the story takes place in 1999 and kicks off in uh, in March. Uh, we're uh, following uh, Jim Doe who is a uh, sheriff's deputy. Um, and, and essentially, in another situation you're not quite sure what to make of, um, he's, uh, he, he basically picks up a high school girl, and they, uh, they drive up to a, a mountain, a ridge of some sort, and they're kind of watching the clouds um, as he's uh, talking with her about the upcoming prom um, that she's trying to get him to attend. Um, but where the action really kicks off is that uh, the actual sheriff, um, somebody who's been very good to Jim Doe, um, runs into a situation. And, and to make a long story short, he is killed um, by an unknown assailant. Um, all we know about this person is that uh, he's Indian and uh, I guess bears a passing resemblance to the person most likely for us to refer to as the protagonist. That would be Jim Doe. Yeah. And I'm going to I'm going to make a little disclaimer right now. Um, about terminology because um, Native American is used in the synopsis. It is definitely not used almost at all in the book. And the word Indian is is kind of the primary descriptor for anybody who's Native American. So that's the language of the book. Um, it's also something that came up when we interviewed Stephen Graham Jones uh, in the last few months where he was talking about how he grew up with the term American Indian and now that Native American and indigenous and all these other terms have cropped up, it's weird for him because that's not the terminology that he grew up with. So if we're saying Indian in this, it's because it's the terminology that's used in the book. But also it's like the terminology that he grew up with as his identity. Um, so it's absolutely not a racist or discrimination thing. It's the terminology that's active for, for, the, for the course of the story. Thank you, Rob. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jim is obviously broken up about this and feels a little bit at fault because he could have uh, he could have been there to help prevent this, and uh, instead he wasn't. But obviously, a manhunt kicks off. But uh, Jim Doe takes it upon himself um, to basically, I don't know, I go a wall is the only term I can think of, but to kind of leave his post as a police officer, um, but but continue to use his police officer. Um, you know, ID and, and stuff uh, to pursue Jim Doe um, across, you know, over the course of this book, quite a few states. I'm sorry, I said Jim Doe to pursue the assailant um, <laughs> across multiple states. Listen, if you've read this book, you'd understand why. And that this isn't a spoiler, <laughs> but everybody in this book at some point thinks 
that Jim Doe is the person on the, you know, like the wanted flyer. <laughs> and in many cases, while he's presenting it to them, like, have you seen this guy? And they're like, well, isn't that you? <laughs> That's actually like a really cool part of it um, where in the beginning it, it, it throws, I, I kind of took it at two ways simultaneously. First of all, it's just like the general, Oh, everybody, all, all of your type look alike kind of thing, but more so that like, um, and, and especially this is leaned into later in the story, the idea that like, yeah, you could be this guy, but that takes on like different meanings as the story goes on, which I think is really good. Like, uh, it, are you that guy? And then later on, it's like, Oh, are you that guy? Like, so as the story goes on, I feel like that, that seed that's planted when he's handing out flyers and people mistake him for the person in the drawing. Um, comes up later in different ways i will go one step farther when i mentioned that this was um c- could be considered a very complicated book I-, I did try to read this 15 ish years ago um and i got to the point where i was like I- clearly i have missed something and that this jimmy doe guy is the 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 killer of the sheriff and I was like, ah, fuck, I don't understand anything that's going on. So I, I, I gave up probably, you know, whatever, 50, 60 pages in in my first go around on this one. It does require a lot of attention and engagement from the reader. That's for sure. Jesse, any thoughts? I mean, I think the... <clears throat> I think the mistaking Jim Doe for Amos throughout the whole book is, I mean, sometimes it's funny, but also it's really good lacing, like interweaving of the past and the present because Jim Doe in a sense was supposed to be Amos. So I think that's a really good, a really good method to kind of convey that in a less conscious sense throughout the storyline yeah and I, I i think this needs to be acknowledged that this was jesse you can back me up on this this was his second book that he wrote right or second novel mm, well no um there's no fast red road was the first then he wrote demon theory and then he did bird is gone and all the beautiful sinners all right. It's an early book in his collection. Yeah. Um, the complexity, as Livius alluded to by the fact that it's confusing, but also like um, it, it absolutely to be felt like the type of book where nothing just happened. Like if something was happening, it was for a reason. It would serve a purpose later in the story. Um, and, and you guys can like uh, back me up on that if you want to. But I feel like like Jesse's saying the fact that we are at a surface level mixing the identities of, of Jim Doe, who is ostensibly the good guy with Amos peace, who at the very beginning of the book is absolutely a bad guy um, was intentional and absolutely like part of like thematically the way the plot was supposed to play out. Oh, I have no doubt. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt. I mean, I'll go one farther since, I mean, Jesse kind of, you know, alluded to some other things, too, is that I think the Tin Man purposely picked Amos for this portion, for like this kind of end game that he was going to because of his similarities to Jim Doe. Yeah, that's uh, so I I mean, I think it's a plot device (laughs) from the villain in the book, not just from the author. That's God damn it. That's such a good that's such such a good point. And that's all right. So like. Can we just like, all right, so we're going to talk about plot, but like, can we just talk about the fact that like, um, like there, uh, I don't even know where to go with this, but like just the idea that, um, there's so much going on. And, um, so the, w- what I was thinking throughout this book is like, this takes the, the cleverness and the, 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 like the plot superiority of like your Thomas Harris, like, um, your Hannibal type stories and just like blows them out of the water. Am I the only one that was like thinking like, Oh, you know, I, I, that's a cute story you told with like silence of the lambs. But what do you, what do you think about, what do you think about something like this? 
Oh man, that that shit doesn't even compare to this. No, scope. like not one bit. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. Yeah. The, this is this is a. It's a story that's woven together. You know, I've I've read all the Thomas Harris um, Hannibal books, and they're they're pretty straightforward. And and I know for some people who are fans of the Hannibal TV show, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, those are. There, there is, I mean, somebody, okay, so the Hannibal TV show is what you would get if somebody with Stephen Graham Jones' mind when he was writing this were trying to interpret Hannibal Lecter stories. Because the, the books yep. themselves or, or the subsequent movies were simpler, and, and I, that's not to say yeah. they were bad, because I really enjoyed them and I really loved the characters in them, but they were far more straightforward narratives than this book is. The Hannibal TV show, on the other hand, some weird shit goes on in there that's not, you know, canon in the in the the uh, Thomas Harris books. Yeah, and they do play with time quite a bit in in the Hannibal show, like directly and just alluding to things, too. So, yeah, you're right. The Yeah, I mean, it's way more like this book than yep. the source material for the show. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, I, I guess in general, so like the, the thing that kicks off the story is, um, you know, this person killing Gentry, who is, is the sheriff, uh, Jim Doe decides he's going to go after him. Um, and then as, as the story unfolds, um, the FBI gets involved and, um, a, a bigger picture is revealed where now, and, and I tried explaining the MO of the serial killer to um, <laughs> my girlfriend. <laughs> and then this is where I want to, because like, it's real specific. And, um, and, and this, this bears a little bit of discussion because realistically, like basically the MO of the serial killer is I'm going to abduct kids who are native American who have just experienced a tornado, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and then I'm going to do my thing with them, but like the victimology, <laughs> granted, this takes place primarily in Tornado Alley, so this is a place where tornadoes are are pretty common. Um, but uh, at the same time, like the Native American thing is very specific and like the boy-girl thing is very specific, so... Um, the idea that like the kids that that it is revealed that the serial killer person is taking um, fit this particular kind of theme is is real specific, right? Um, yeah. yeah, but but brilliant in a way too, because I think the thing you missed out of that particular explanation is that the tornado is a cover or, or tries to be a cover for what he does, right? So he he mm -hmm. tries to make people think, and, and with some success, and I don't know how much we'll talk about that success, <sighs> that the tornado has scooped up these children so that there's not missing children. There's children that were lost to a, to a tornado. Mm -hmm. And there's oh, yeah. a, um, an Indian uh, story about the whirlwind man mm -hmm. who takes children as well, which he likely learned from scouts. <laughs> Boy scouts. Not only that, but the Tin Man's pain for the it's pain for the people that he takes too through insurance. Oh, That's right. oh wow. That's so, right. so, so, so we've moved right to the end of the book. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I it's tell like you a... I thought I thought that was just a well the most brilliant t twist in this book at least was was that that yeah. That that essentially. Oh my God! Yeah. 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 yeah so um, that's true. All right. So like, and and you guys all tied it together greatly. I'm I'm glad that as a as the four of us, we all kind of brought this whole like idea into perspective. Um. Uh. But um. The weird thing is that this is still all surface level. There's so many other layers below it that led to why this person is particularly taking native american kids and why you know why why it's all going on but like that's the that's the base mo um and and throughout the course of the book we get to we get to discover 
in a very kind of roundabout way um, all the motivations of what brought this person to this point, um, which is which is crazy, but also like seeing how the people who are victims of him along the way um, were impacted by that and what it led to. And that's not even getting into the fact that like he like kind of was creating proteges. There's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, That's when I said it was complicated kids. I I wasn't kidding. (laughs) There is, there is a lot of things going on. I mean, we're introduced to um, also to to like multiple villains, either, either today or previously. So we've talked about um, Amos um, who, who kills the sheriff uh, in the, in the, the very first like proper chapter of the book. Um, you know, there's the Tin Man who we'll say is the mastermind, but then like we're introduced to the to his mentor, Jesse James, and, and we're we do that through today's investigation, but also through flashbacks where where we see what happened, um, you know, and then also from you know, FBI files. So the Jesse James was uh was taken down by uh by uh, Agent Tim Creed. So obviously the FBI gets involved in this. They've, they've you know, as, as bodies start to turn up and, and there's very obviously um, uh, his method of disposing bodies is that they are discovered in, in fairly grotesque ways, which we alluded to a little bit from, from the prologue. Um, so the FBI gets involved and then eventually um, Jim Doe teams up with the FBI. But this has a really, really broad cast of characters. I mean, there's got to be there's got to be 30 characters with like decent, um, you know, screen time, page time, whatever you want to call it in this book, too. So there's a lot of different things going on. So we're introduced to no less than three villains, um, you know, probably seven or eight law enforcement agents, um, multiple victims slash accomplices. So there, there's a lot to keep track of when you're when you're going through this book, for sure. Yep, yeah, and I think uh, one of the greatest things about this book is it puts the reader in almost the detective mode and uh, with the way that the chapters are numbered with dates and cities um, and then Livius you're talking about all these characters it's almost like this book is one of those bulletin boards you know bound into a book and I can just see it spread out a map of the United States and all these pins and dots and victims and and all the little details that they know um all woven together we're just trying to figure it out one chapter at a time one case at a time one character at a time i want to point out that of of all of us jesse has read this by far the most number of times so like i'm i I keep waiting for him to like (laughs) chime in with insight and stuff like that (laughs) but um yeah, uh, it, it's there's just there's so much going on, and um, what Missy's comment just made me think about is the fact that like while there's such a great um, procedural investigative like aspect to the book, um, absolutely like with laser precision, the amount of time that needs to be spent on character like building. And um, like fleshing out characters is, is is done. It's just done perfectly. Like everybody's got like a backstory that you care about as much as you need to for the like the sake of that character. Um, so characterization is just like I, I can't tell you how great he does at like making you care about the things that happened to make the characters do what they're doing right now. Yeah, I think one of the things that Stephen does well in, you know, I'll say everything that I've read because nothing jumps out at me right now that I, you know, would say that just characters like relationships between people. And um, how do I say this? I feel like the characters always act right for the circumstance. So there, there's a lot of, um, you know, one word exchanges through this book or very, very short exchanges where, um, you know, you're left to infer a lot. Um, versus long drawn out explanations about what somebody's feelings are on a matter. And and I think that this story works at multiple levels. So intricate, Rob mentioned character development, character interaction, um, all the individual things are done really, really well. And and that's something he continues to do to, to this day with his most recent book. Agreed. Who's flipping through their copy? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. 
probably probably all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. Speaking of flipping, because we we all read the the hardcover, right? The original the yes. original printing of this book on right. was it rugged rugged land or whatever. I just gotta say, this is a really beautiful book design and layout. It's yes. a d- damn good looking book. Just giving Rob a chance to edit out the page flipping. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so we could talk more about specifics. Like I said, I think we we've kind of um, you know the the cat's out of the bag on this one. Um, one of my favorite moments in the book was um, the the demise of one of the FBI agents. I'm still trying to keep it vague. Um, but but an FBI agent gets a gets basically set up at one point and I, I did not see that coming. And it, it was, uh, you know, along with the, the insurance ploy, um, easily one of my favorite parts of this book. I mean, that, that really, I, I, I'm sure it's been done before. I'm sure I've seen that kind of thing, but I think it was executed very, very well in this book. Do you guys, I mean, first, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Just don't yeah. be coy, dude. All right. So when, when, uh, when Cody, when Cody eats it because he's been uh, dressed up in the fireman's outfit, which is what every law enforcement agent is looking at, like in the town. And he's got like the two kids, like, I don't know, stapled to him or taped to him or whatever. Yeah. 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 No, that was good. I like all the FBI characters in this, in this book. I thought the, the way they act with each other and relate to each other was was really well written and interesting and it's just it it gave it that extra depth that i really love in in thrillers like this or you know killer stories where where you can trace it back to earlier things too so like all the stuff with with creed and and jesse wiggs and all that was a really good addition to the story and one of my one of my favorite parts overall is is the origin parts of of the tin man like when they flash back to the military yes. base as him as a kid and like i know we were talking amongst ourselves before before the episode about what what this might look like actually cinematically how it would how it's pretty pretty prime for like a mini series instead of a movie type setup and i know we've talked about this on past episodes about other shows we've watched and we like how you get those single episodes that kind of step back from the main plot and zoom in on a particular character and whatnot. And that entire 4th of July backstory section would just be a really perfect hour long episode of TV in and of itself. The whole Colpin 301 JN HK for, for GB, like Mm -hmm. the whole, the whole ham radio thing, like mm-hmm. I really, really loved the airbase and backstory situation. Well, were this to ever get picked up for TV, I think you have to give it to the the True Detective guys. Oh yes, they would do a good, damn good job with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think True Detective had a very similar flavor to it um, as this book, or at least, at least for me, it did. Yeah, and um, I want to go back to like just uh, just talking about like the excellent storytelling and how like things always have something that they mean or something that they lead to. So everything that Jesse just said about the 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 early life of of the Tin Man um, actually plays out later on, um, not only in how he develops into the the you know, the, the late stage kind of like serial killer person that he is, but also like just in like the, the technical way that he always knows what's going on with the FBI. Oh, he did the ham radio stuff. So he knows about communication and he was a lineman and like everything comes up later in a way where that thing that happened earlier on, that was just a kid's like love because, you know, his parents gave him a gift at one point turns into something that is, fundamental for someone later on to evade um capture by the fbi so there's there's always like something going on with these details that plate that pays off later on in a very specific and very satisfying way because there's really like there's no loose ends in the story that i could think of off the top of my head 
No, not at all. I, I where the hell did the Mennonites come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because early in the book, it's a, it's a it's a misreading of something, right? But then later on, the Mennonites actually mean something. Am I wrong about that? Maybe I'm wrong about that. That's okay. There is a moment where there is a misreading of it, but I can't remember if it was the first time or. <laughs> well, um, and someone, I think it was Cody. Yeah, Co someone says Mennonite about something, and they're like, "Oh no, it was this." But later on, Mennonites come up, and you're like, "Oh, so." thematically there's there's a re like it's almost like he was like easing you into the idea that like Amish people were involved or something mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah I just thought that was just a weird like and and for anybody who's listening um the, the Mennonites always show up in the tornado areas um yeah <laughs> and almost like they have like predictive ability like like the Mennonites get there before the tornado does and are just prepared to like help people. <laughs> so of course, because yeah. our our grand villain in this book, the Tin Man, um, also um, is always seems to be around during tornadoes. There there's some talk about um, you know about Mennonites and and their ability to to be first on the scene for for tornado assistance and cleanup. But it was just like out of nowhere, all of a sudden, we're just like, what, what the fuck is happening here? Um, one more thing that Jones does well, and and again, fresh off of uh, of read off of reading his most recent book, The Only Good Indians, is um, I just feel like I get a good look at least at what Stevens' um, experience with the Native American culture is, um, and and it's like, how do I say that? I read this at a book in 2020. And now I'm going back to a book that's 18 years old and getting um, a lot of the same vibes. And I know there have been other books of his I've read that were like that, too, which which is always kind of uh, it's always kind of nice, I guess, to get someone's take on, on you know, what their life experiences are um, and not. Um, I don't know how to say it. Not not somebody's idea of it, but somebody who I, I, I'm going to assume that some of the things that come up in this book in, in the in the Native American culture are things that Stephen actually participated in or or was privy to or something, and it it feels very genuine, I guess, and I like that. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, now that you bring up the only good Indians, kind of jogs something in my head too. I mean. Obviously, in the only good Indians, there's a lot of basketball in that book, and there's the bat. There's the one basketball scene in this one, and I believe this is this is the first instance of of that in one of his books where it's a bargaining system. The idea that if you make X number of shots, you can undo some horrible thing that's happened, and I I believe it's Growing Up Dead in Texas where that comes back in basically in the exact same way too where a character is you know just you know they're out shooting baskets because it's a mindless thing you can like do with your body while your your head is going through grief and other feelings and whatnot and the whole the whole bargaining thing comes up in that book as well and that that seems to be something that's that's in a handful of of steven's book is the the bargaining idea like if i if i just do this or if i make that then this won't have happened. I don't know uh, how much more we're going to talk about plot. Um, do you guys have anything more you want to talk? Like, do you feel like there's anything that we haven't said that is important to talk about about the the overall story? I don't know about story, but I I just got to say, like for for some reason, I thought we were going to be doing the old video thing again because I'm probably most used to us doing the the. The the video review. The holiday because, episodes, yeah. Because of holiday episodes and whatnot. So I am currently, even though you can't see it, I'm wearing my Def Leppard Hysteria Tour t shirt right oh, now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to stop you right there because um, for, for nobody knows this, but Jesse has a, a travel shirt, like a, a flying shirt. Every yeah. time Every time you fly, you wear this Def Leppard shirt. And the the first like when when it was basically mentioned that Amos um, Amos Peace, who it, it kills Gentry at the beginning, and he's like one of the main bad guys, is wearing a Def Leppard shirt, and then they go into 
his experience with Def Leppard, um, all I could think about was you, Jesse. So is there any <laughs> is there any connection there, or is that just a fun coincidence? Uh, connection, like as to why I have the shirt. Or... Yeah, was were you inspired to have the Def Leppard shirt? I'm um, like, it, like it for people who are listening who don't know Jesse. Having a Def Leppard shirt totally makes sense for Jesse. However, <laughs> it wasn't until reading this book that I thought, oh, maybe there's a different reason that he has the shirt. No, I've ac- I've actually had this shirt since I was a kid. It's an original t- tour T-shirt. Aww. Yeah. So it's it's one of the probably the only one that has lasted this long in my life without just getting completely destroyed in one fashion or another. <laughs> traveling shirt. I need a traveling shirt. That's true, though, right, Jesse? <laughs> that that's the shirt you wear when you fly. It is. It's my it's my flying shirt. I don't know when I became when I started to have a thing or a superstition about that, where like, I just, I need to have this, this thing that I do when I fly, but it somehow became the Def Leppard t-shirt. Weirdly, I actually kind of also have a flying shirt and it's a mystery science theater 3000 shirt that I wear, um, that I got from supporting the, um, the Kickstarter when they were trying to bring it back. Oh, nice. I believe Misty has a flying hat. <laughs> They're all flying hats. There you go. <laughs> Misty has a flying alcoholic beverage. That as well. Um, I mean, speaking only... of... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, Jesse, go ahead. I was going to say, speaking of music, too, because, I mean, you know, there's the whole Def Leppard concert scene, like learning, learning to track someone and kill them and whatnot, but... I always thought it was really cool that Steely Dan was used the way it was in this book. Right. That it was that it was a char- character identifier type thing and that it was woven throughout like little clues like, oh, he's listening to the Royal Scam. Like that's the only cassette that he has on him and in his car. And Steely Dan was used in the in Creed's old Jesse Wiggs case and whatnot. So I thought that was another neat little device to weave through the story yeah and honestly like i can't imagine we've done the story justice like there's so like every time we say one thing like seven things pop up that i'm like oh this was an amazing thing that happened um so like this is probably more of a piecemeal discussion of of like things in the moment than you know something that's more like of a deep dive that's thought out but like yeah that that plays out in so many ways, like um, like later on with the development of characters, like how the concert is like the the proving ground for it's like the it's like a test, it's like a final exam in like being like a protege killer. Fucking crazy, just crazy stuff. I do wonder what his um, method was for outlining or whatever you want to call it to be able to place so many things and keep all of it straight. You know, it's, it's, you know, we, of course we didn't do the story justice. This is why I laughed when you said you were trying to explain this to your girlfriend, because I don't know how exactly. you explain this. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's a little bit like trying to explain house of leaves to somebody. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible. It's kind of why I laughed too during the synopsis where I was like, okay, yeah, it's, guy gets killed. Cop goes after him. That's it. There's your synopsis, you know. Um, the only other thing I wanted to touch on is there's also a character named Micah who is, who is in this, who I think um, it, it's it's a great look. So she is also another, you know, protege of the Tin Man, but she is captured. Um, and, and just every scene with her in it, um, you know, after her capture is is just like a great a great look, you know, I know that we talked about it being cinematic. I thought the same thing that this should be a, you know, at least a a 10 hour series on Netflix or something as I was reading it. But, um, she's another great character that he does a really good job with. Oh, definitely. She's, she's really creepy. It's kind of how, like when you're watching a movie and then you find out that the killer is like a kid, like the, the last person you'd expect. Cause it's like, 
oh my god, you're just a kid, you can't possibly be that evil. So, like, in some ways, Micah's kind of creepier than the Tin Man. Like, the Tin Man almost feels detached at times in this book, and maybe it's just because it's, like, a decades-long plan that they've got going on and with all the different identities and whatnot. But, yeah, Micah just seemed kind of extra, extra freaky while reading that. I'll I'll agree, and I'm going to pose a question to everybody. Um, so, this is building off of what Jesse just said. Um, throughout the course of the book, we find out why the Tin Man became what he was. Um, there was the whole thing about trying to kill himself and it not working. So he thinks he's got this like not superpower, but he's just kind of like special in a way. Building on that, the whole like weird experience with Jesse James and, and then like kind of flipping the power on, on Jesse James. So we see like this evolution of a killer, which makes sense. And it's like a pretty story that you could tie up with a bow and everything, but the people he creates are just people who just didn't have any choice, but to survive in this fucked up like environment where they're taught that the right way to live is, you're going to be this killer person. So like, I think that a lot of the creepiness that comes out of the characters like Micah and Amos are the fact that they are, um, kind of, I don't want to say tortured into, but like, um, they're, um, like exposed to this, like the, all the horrors of the world without, any kind of personal motivation it's all external and it's like being forced mm -hmm. on them and i feel like th like it's either you survive or or you go crazy or you die or whatever it is so like they the only ch choice they had was to actually become creepier and more fucked up in a way yeah. than a tin man what do you think well i i mean i i agree wholeheartedly right so they're mentored and and the ones that don't do well don't don't get to be micah and amos right so, you know, they, they look to him as a father figure and, and, you know, and, and much like parental, you know, issues, sometimes you do something to uh, appease your, your parent. And then in some cases you do something, you know, to spite your parent. So yeah, it is, it is a very creepy thing that he takes kids typically around the age of, you know, 10 to 12 and then trains them to do this. And clearly not all of them, um, you know, pass, so to speak. To, to make it out into the world. Um, but it's also interesting because he nurtures them. And then in some cases, so in Micah's case, she is essentially sent out, right? So she's got the, the happy birthday tattoo, which is when you realize right. that she was meant to be caught. She was sacrificed. So you have this yeah. relationship where he kind of fathers these, these killers, but then is also willing to, um, you know, throw them into the fire if it serves his greater purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like like we've talked before about like the idea of the if this was a mini series, you know, give it give it ten episodes or twelve episodes or whatever. Like I was saying, the old the culp and backstory could be a standalone episode. You could have a whole episode alone with with training and teaching the kids basically, because they go through all the lessons of, you know, wiretapping and weapons and anatomy and and dismemberment and and chemistry and all these other things, which is another really creepy set piece within the book, that whole section about the basement and the lessons that the kids were taught and what they had to do and what happened if they succeeded or failed. Dude. Uh, yeah. And the more I think about it in cinematic terms, the more I think about it as like, I don't think one season would do this justice. I feel like you could get to like, like season one could be, the the initial like pursuit up to the point where like the FBI figures out maybe something more deeper is going on and boom that takes you into a second season and that kind of takes me to the fact that like there's a pretty decently delineated three act structure going on in this book even though I think there's actually four parts in the book if I if I remember correctly um but like I feel like Steven even early on in his writing career really understood like how to take something and break it up into um, very specific, like kind of narrative sections that that build on each other. 
Oh, absolutely. Miss Misty, any thoughts? Um, oh, about it being a, a series specifically, or I was kind of hung up on the horrific nature of how he trained the children, or as you said, groomed. Oh, go off um, on that. I, I do. I, well, I think um, one of the things that I do want to emphasize, because most of what we're talking about is, is uh, the craft of the book, I think, and um, which is extraordinary, of course. I mean, Stephen is a master of both uh, the structure and language itself. I don't know if we're going to do quotes at all, but um, he uses language beautifully. But this is also one of the most horrific novels I've ever read. And I, do, uh, I think I forgot in the decade between readings just how creepy uh, pieces of this story are and specifically what is done to these children who, number one, survived a tornado and then get rescued by a fireman only to find themselves in a completely different reality and becoming totally different beings. Um, it's terrifying. It is a terrifying story. It'll keep you up at night. In a way, it's kind of extra creepy to to read or reread it now and think about, you know, think about stories like this and what happens in this book specifically and the killer's methods and the Tin Man's methods and whatnot. Like using, I mean, just, just like using two and all, which even when the time that this book was written was an antiquated drug, more or less, and whatnot. And we've gotten so technologically advanced and beyond so many different things that you kind of wonder if, what if a killer emerged in, in our society that used, used old methods and old systems? Like, how long would it take for them to get caught? Or would it be a cross-country trek like this book, you know, with multiple agents and multiple cities and, and whatnot trying to track someone just because they don't really have the they don't have the tools anymore because the tools have been passed by for something newer, you know? Yeah. And I think that kind of speaks to the scope of the villain, um, which I think we've done somewhat of, a, 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 of justice to, but like in a, in a general sense, you think about like, we contrasted this character, we contrasted Hannibal as, as far as a, like a cinematic perspective. But like one of the things that happened in, in Hannibal is, um, Hannibal as a villain has the ability to plan things out over multiple years. Um, and absolutely this is happening in this book as well. And as much as like some of the, the, the people that are, are, are the way that like the FBI gets clues reveals information about like specific characters who had an impact on the, the main killer years or decades ago in a way that is revealed only later in the book. And so there's this like layered, um, it's obvious that this person who is the, the big bad has planned and thought about a lot of these things very meticulously to play out over the course of years, as opposed to just, I'm going to keep doing the thing until I get caught. So, um, playing on what, what Jesse was saying, the idea of using, old sedatives that two and all um, for anybody who's listening who hasn't read the book is like the sedative that uh, or it's kind of like an early roofie almost because it makes people sedate and, and suggest suggestible um, it plays into the age of the, the villain, but also like shows it is an element of, of, of showing how thoughtful and planned out the whole, whole thing has been. Yeah, and the amount of patience that that would take from an individual. Well, and now that you guys mentioned that, I don't know, um, and maybe Misty, you, you could probably um, speak better to this because I know you watch a lot of true crime stuff. I don't know that serial killers today have long-term plans. I mean, from everything I can think of, it almost seems like <clears throat> opportunity and then next opportunity. 
versus something that's far more thought out, like um, like we're talking about the Tin Man. So you think it's like more like maybe spree killers nowadays yeah. versus yeah. Well, and maybe all along. I don't. I don't just want to say nowadays. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to every every serial killer or spree killer. I'm you know I can think of seem to be more of an opportunist than having like a long term plan, which is probably what makes the Tin Man more frightening. You know, than if you were to write a, you know, a, a Dahmer type character. Yeah, I th- um, that is a great point, and I'm I'm racking my brain to think about any um, that I know of that would have had a long term plan. Um, one of the things that came to mind was BTK. I don't know if um, how familiar you are with him, Dennis Rader, mm-hmm. but one of the reasons that he wrote so often um, to um, the police or the the newspapers or what have you, I can't even remember now, was because he was frustrated at not being caught and he wasn't getting enough attention. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he continued, he was out, um, he was not caught for decades. He didn't necessarily have uh, a plan to create a protege like the Tin Man, but um, he definitely kept going until he was like, hey, I want you to know who I am. Um, the other one that I know is going on for decades is uh, the Long Island serial killer, Lisk. Um, but again, I think it's more of how ca- if you can um, not be captured, not necessarily have some big grand scheme again, like the Tin Man. Mm-hmm. So, um, right. just like you're talking about, it's just uh, opportunity and victimology for the most part. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that is like the Hollywood side of things, because like the first thing that I think of is the, the movie Seven and how mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. it was a killer with a plan for seven deaths to tell a story, more or less. And it's like mm-hmm. all of these things had to fall in place and it's very intricate and it and it relies on things happening the way that you want them to happen. Whereas like I, I think in an app in, in, in a general actual killer perspective, um you know, it, it it's it's what Misty was saying, but it, it, for the sake of this story, I think that the difference is that the Tidman starts to do things in reaction to people being on his trail as opposed to like this was part of the narrative from the beginning oh hmm all right so I, I was under the impression that I mean like I said that he knew this was coming to an end mostly because of you know his perceived health conditions and stuff so I felt like he was trying to tie things up at the end. So not necessarily that the long-term plan from 30 years ago was for it to end, you know, the, the way it did, but that he was definitely moving towards some type of end to what was going on. Did just hear Misty you guys have thoughts on that? All right. No thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally no opinion. <laughs> I agree with that. I didn't know because I thought Jesse's uh, ring around his initials started, so I thought he was starting to speak. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think he had a thirty-year plan, um, but he definitely was preparing for a replacement, which I don't think I've ever heard of happening in in true crime. Hmm. Which I know that I'm adding to what you were really saying or asking, Livius, but um, mm-hmm. Jesse, he didn't have the Tin Man didn't have this the the end game in mind from the beginning, or did he? I mean that I mean that in particular is ambiguous in in the book. We, there's no way for us to know how far ahead he was looking at all. But given how intricately everything is woven, mm-hmm. we, we could say that there is a plan to an extent. It's just, you know, like a, like a true crime story, someone gets caught and convicted finally. There's still unaccounted bodies out there. 
Mm -hmm. we're, we're never going to know the full truth. And I think that's, that's a big aspect of this book is it, like, it's a part of it is it's like, wow, look how, look how deep this goes. Look how far back this goes. And yet we're never going to have any idea of how far the ripples went out into the world right. and, and what they sucked down with them when they were coming back in. Well, wasn't one of the kind of conceits at the end or, 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 or the conclusions that was made about the motivation of the Tin Man that this was like the third suicide? Like this was his way of just trying to like finally end it? A am I wrong about that? I think I that I or I or that was my reading as well. Sorry, go ahead, Livius. No, and that's what I said. I think that he knew this was kind of at the end. I still think he he his last kind of like bucket list item was to knock off Jim Doe. Yeah, I, I think he just wanted a tidy story. To be honest mm -hmm. with you, like if yeah. I was if I was in the in the shoes of the Tin Man, like this guy had a pretty normal life that like kind of got fucked up for weird reasons that had to do with like CBs, which totally makes sense because if you've ever known anybody that's like a like a <laughs> like a cb or ham radio person like they're not normal <laughs> right it's just run the other way like that's where shit starts to go wrong is like why are you a ham radio operator <laughs> man everyone was all worried in the 80s about metal music they should have been worried about fucking ham radio they really <laughs> honestly like that was where like like when your dad does some shitty sh all right, let's talk about the fucking dad throwing the radio in the boat. Kid, get over it, man. Like, there are other things in life. Like, if that's like a, if that's an inciting action to like you're becoming a serial killer, the problem wasn't anything but you from the beginning. And I think that that's a lesson we all need to know about, right? I mean, yeah. all I, I, I don't have necessarily an opinion on that. All I can tell you is today's ham radios don't hold up after they've been underwater. So I, they must have just made them better back in the right. 60s. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but the weird, like, I, I can feel that the idea of the Jesse James character being a creep but like the way that that was kind of flipped around to like, this is a weird rapist to like, I'm making him kind of an accessory to killing. Am I right about that? Is that kind of how it went down? Yeah. I yeah. We mentioned it earlier about him being kind of a mentor and really he wasn't, he was just he a, was rapist. a victim. He was a rapist that became like complicit in a weird mm -hmm. murder scheme. Right. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was all, it was all Harry Carey at that point. Right, right. You know, which is which is just which is just three hundred one JN and James Colpin and whatnot. Because like, yeah, Wiggs Wiggs went back in. I mean, man, like, okay, yeah. <laughs> I I don't I don't know how to say this, but as far as any rapist that's ever been portrayed in a narrative, he's the weirdest, right? Because like. He's a rapist who goes back and revisits the women His he's victims, raped yeah. to like to like check on them and check on the kids that he fathered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um like it like it's a sort of tourism to him, which which makes it that much worse and that much more crass and vile. Like Which but then the fact that like Culpin makes him like understand that like he's killing these people now like they're dead because he raped them earlier is like extra fucked up right am i right about that mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah that's sure. that's oh man there's so many there's this is an infinite onion guys because there's just layers i, I feel bad for anybody who's listening to this because they're like what the hell <laughs> is even happening <laughs> like there's right. no way this makes sense to anybody I agree. No. And that's why I said I can't I can't imagine how he was able to string this together in some kind of um format to keep up with it. You know, so I, I know like ideas, you know, come to people halfway through, right? So then you can like retroactively plant the seeds or earlier on. But there's just so much going on. I, I can't I, I can't process how somebody would uh map this out. 
if I remember, if I remember correctly, I mean, I, I can't answer specifically how it was mapped out, but I'm, I believe, um, Stephen wrote a piece about the writing of this book when it was getting, uh, redone by Desink after he had gone in and kind of basically written the whole book and turned it into a, another, a different novel, but similar. And I think he was saying that when, when he got approached by this, this agency rugged land, because he sent them, I believe he sent them demon theory and they rejected it very horribly. Like really did not think highly of that book at all, but they rec they recognized that he was a good writer and if I remember correctly, they pitched to him the idea of doing a thriller. And so I think Stephen had had said in an interview or a blog post somewhere that, you know, after that, he then inhaled, like, basically every thriller on the market to kind of suck in the genre and, like, learn the ins and outs. So I think he just kind of mastered the entirety of the thriller as a whole and just basically <laughs> spat this, spat this this book out like he like became an expert <laughs> in thrillers like every every thriller was in his head every trope every you know pitfall or whatever it was all there so i think maybe that like having that in the back of his head helped him navigate this narrative because it is so intricate and it doesn't have the pitfalls that a lot of thrillers do and it's not as simple as some of the other ones i mean you know that's not a bad thing necessarily like we said you know science of the lambs is a simple book but it's a really good book but i think he was just able to go like 10 steps further than that all right i can't tell you how much sense that makes to me because when what? i was reading this story <laughs> my thought was like this is literally everything. This is everything that you could expect for a story like this, like done the way that it's supposed to be done. So that makes perfect sense. If he like basically consumed a genre and decided like this is the exemplary version of what that story is, absolutely that makes perfect sense to me because that is what this story is. There's nothing missing and there's nothing done wrong. It's a hundred percent like a perfect story for this genre. Yeah. After you um, explained that, Jesse, I was thinking that might be a better uh, blurb for this book than what Livius read at the top. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I don't that's... know if that's true. Maybe I'm just making up stories in my head. Because, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, reading interviews like you know, 10, 15 years ago and, and trying to remember that now and whatnot. But like on top of that, even more like, or in addition to that too, cause this was rugged land. He had contracted with them to do two books and seven Spanish angels was going to be the second book, but rugged land never released oh, it. Yeah. And I can't remember if it was ever said what the reason was, but when Dezank did the reprint series for this book in the new form, Seven Spanish Angels, that's when that was finally released, too, electronically through Dezank. And that was supposed to be the second Rugged Land book. So it was like, you know, two thrillers done back to back. Um, I really thought you were going to say they rejected Demon Theory and said, how about you do a thriller? And he was like, well, what about a sheriff gets killed in a cop chases him? And they were like, that, do that. And then he <laughs> sent them this one. <laughs> Well, the, so the interesting thing is, like, uh, early on in our podcast, one of the first times we read Stephen Graham Jones was Zombie Bake Off. And we uh, did a, we had David James Keaton join us for the review. And, like, the thing that Keaton kind of latched onto was that he basically took the idea of zombie stories and evolved it into something bigger. And I feel like that was kind of a theme for us as a podcast going on in the future was, all right, what genre or like kind of sub story did, did Jones perfect or, or what did he build on or evolve? So, um, yeah, 
it just makes total sense to me that he would take an idea and either hone it down to its just vital parts or take it and elevate it to something that's more than it was before. Mm. Agreed. All right, listen, guys, we're at 70 minutes about talking about this book, so I'm pretty sure no one's listening anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to ask us to go into wrap-ups. I'm not sure exactly. I know that Rob and I are using our current scoring system for this, um, so uh, I guess maybe we'll go to our guests. So, um, Jesse, I think you should have the honor of going first. Um, give us some 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 final thoughts on this, and then score it out of 10 for us, if you would. Um, this is... Shit, I can't remember now if this this might have been the first book of his I read. Um, it's kind of it's been so long and my mind my, my memory is just not what it used to be, so I can't be sure. But I'm pretty sure I've read this one more than any of his other books. It, well, Demon Theory probably beats it out and whatnot. So I always consider this to be a perfect novel. Pretty much, and then when the reprint or the the yeah the Dizank series came out, I read that too. And man, I think that version is just absolutely brilliant. But I love this one so much, and it's kind of cool that people get to read both because they do have different things going on in them. And yeah, like we were talking about thrillers earlier, how I mean they're all good, they're all fun. Some of them are really simple, and I love how. I love how woven this book is that it's it has such intricacies into it and it just really, really jives with, with my head and my sensibilities. So it's always been one of my top favorite books. And I mean, if I had to give it a score out of 10, it, like seriously probably would just be a straight up 10. The only, the only thing that I could see, you know, as a flaw is seriously that it's not longer. Like, I kind of want this to be, like, Stephen King's It. You know, I want I want a good, like, eight, eight to 1,200 pages of this story because I think there is way much more he could have told in telling the story and going through all the characters' histories and whatnot. Now, we could have gotten a fuller picture of, of the Tin Man and what he did and who he did what with because... You know, like you said, Livius, we get kind of three main villains in this book, but you know that he affected so many more people. And it's kind of like I want the unexpurgated version, or however you say that word, of this book. Like, I want the full Tin Man story from beginning to end. And, you know, we could even start before the Tinker Air Base with James Colpin. I mean, we could start with him as a younger kid than a than a teenager and just go all the way through to the end. Like, I think that would be pretty phenomenal to get something of that scope, but I love this book and I love the other version too, which is pared down and is probably more like, like we were saying, this one is probably more like a TV series, you know, like a 10 episode thing. And the, the design version, the design version, I think it'd be a really neat, like three hour movie or two and a half hour movie, something like Zodiac was, you know, but yeah, this to me is pretty much a 10 across the board. Misty. (laughs) Um, I'm so glad that we had Jesse on for this. Jesse, this has been a treat to hear um, all the, all the things, you know, and um, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, Oh, God, I feel like I'm forgetting everything. (laughs) (laughs) No, Uh, mine's going to be a a little shorter just to to piggyback on some of the things he already explained. But um, I love how much it engages the reader. Um, You you do have to pay attention to this book, um, which is a good thing. Um, The premise is terrifying. So if you're looking for a thriller, this is right up your alley. Uh, The detective work is long and excruciating and real. I do uh, spend a lot of time with true crime and all avenues, podcasts, documentaries, and books. And 
this feels like a real story. Excellent characters. I know we've talked a lot about those. And then uh, we didn't get to spend a lot of time on this, but the use of language is unparalleled. Steven is masterful. And if you're looking for uh, something extraordinary in a book as well as a good story, this is for you. Um, I'm going to agree with Jesse, and I'm giving this a big 10. Rob, okay if I go next? Go for it, my man. All right, here's where I'm going to uh, diverge a little bit from uh, from the group, I think. Um, back when we did Demon Theory, and I mean, I had flashbacks to Demon Theory, um, I think the story is great. I love the layers, and there's individual parts of it I really like. There's something about Stephen's early writing that always perplexes me. I find myself having to reread paragraphs, uh, sometimes two or three times, and then sometimes just giving up on, on knowing what what we're referring to or, or whatever. Um, I see my co-hosts did not have that same problem, um, but it, it's just like Demon Theory. I think that the concept is great, and I think there's individual great parts of the book, but um, from an individual scoring system, this took, a, this took a huge hit under the narrative category for me. Um, I think if you like intricate stories and uh, and you don't have a you don't have a deadline to finish it in either, because that um, I probably would not have read this on my own in a week. I probably would have taken a little more time with it. Um, but for me, that I think maybe the, the the brevity of time that I had to read it maybe um, impacted the score more than if I took this a little slower. But I did feel the exact same way about demon theory. So I've, I've really liked, uh, I, I believe every other Jones book I've read, but these two kind of suffer from that same confusing problem from me. And I, I don't know how much of that story and how much of that is just how the story is presented. Um, so after factoring all that in with a, a very low score and narrative, um, it still comes out to a 7.25. I think that there are people who would get a lot of enjoyment out of reading this book. And quite frankly, if you wanted to go through it a second time, I, I get the feeling that that would maybe clear some things up. And on a second reading, my score would probably be higher, I think. I don't know, but I do suspect that's the case. But uh, this uh, first time around, 7.25 for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Um I scored this very highly in practically every category. I'm just going to start out by saying I gave this 8.75 out of 10. Um, mostly nines and tens, a couple of sevens. And the sevens, honestly, were just ones that were like, hey, these were like a perfect example of how this would happen in a story, but nothing that actually like pushed the story to a higher level. So like narrative and pace for me, pace specifically, um, it reads slowly. Uh, narrative and pace kind of tie together basically based on what Livius was saying. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about Jones writing is that sometimes the things he says don't immediately make sense. And so um, what I what I do in those situations is I think to myself, if this doesn't make sense now, how is it going to be revealed later? Um, so there's a little bit of work, a little bit of like, kind of thought that you need to carry through um, throughout the story when something like that comes up because there are absolutely logical leaps or there is information that's given that doesn't mean anything now that might be important later on. Um, but also pace. There's so, it's such a dense story. Like we spent more than an hour talking about the plot in an unspoilery way. And I'm sure it was still confusing to people. So there's so much information. <laughs> There's so much information in the story that um, it, it's it's a lot, and so the pace suffers from the fact that you have to know so much going going through the story. That being said, um, this is absolutely um, far and above anything you could expect from whatever genre you choose to place this in, because it, like like Jesse said earlier, it, it's a perfect book nothing's wrong with it if there is a flaw in the reading it's in your ability to understand what happens but that's not your fault not everybody can read at the same level and so um it comes down it's this weird paradox where jones wrote something so good that it suffers from the fact that it's so good i think is what it comes down to 
<laughs> All that being said, <laughs> it's so ambitious. It's so crazy. He's like, it, it, it blows away everything. Anyway. I gave it 8.75 out of 10. The two places that it suffered at all were in narrative and pace for the reasons that I that I explained before. But I think that those aren't bad things. I think they're just things that make it more difficult for someone to, like, accept. So, um, overall, if you add up mine and Livius' scores and average them out, it's 8. Um, but this book, man is practically unassailable, if you ask me. All right. Um, I've been dying to know what Jesse's pick is. I've been sitting here for 80 minutes now, <laughs> patiently waiting for us to be done with this book so I can find out what Jesse's Patreon pick is. So, Jesse, what's it going to be, buddy? All right. My Patreon pick is... The People's Act of Love by James Meek. All right, I am pulling this up on Amazon right now. James Meek, an April 2019 release. Does that does that sound uh, about right? And it's for oh, publication date 2007. Sorry, I'm looking at the Kindle yeah. edition. Um. So let's see, set in a time of great social upheaval, warfare, and terrorism, and against a stark, lawless Siberia at the end of the Russian Revolution, the People's Act of Love portrays the fragile coexistence of a beautiful, independent mother raising her son alone, a, megalo, me, me, a megalomaniac, Czech captain, and his restless regiment, and a mystical, separatist Christian sect. When a mysterious, charismatic stranger trudges into their snowy village with a frighteningly outlandish story to tell, its balance is shaken to the core. Well, that doesn't sound heavy at all. <laughs> it's 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 really quick reading. I I think you'll kind of get sucked into it. It's not the prose isn't heady, if that so to speak, you know. And like I told, I think I told Rob. Um, because just he was he was asked wondering about this and like why this book or whatever and this has actually always been one of my one of my top favorite books since it came out. It's um it's one of those rare books that you read it and you're just kind of. When I read it, I was completely fucking blown away and wasn't expecting what I read at all and it just I don't know it just kind of clicked something in my brain if that makes sense. Um, I will reserve judgment until after I read this book on if that makes sense or not. <laughs> um, Probably for the best. <laughs> I, I will say that I don't think we've ever read anything that would fall into this category, Rob. I mean, does that sound like, I mean, remotely like anything genre wise that we've read? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that that would kind of fall into that category. No, so I think this will be a first for us. Yeah. As a podcast, at least, maybe like off the podcast yeah. we've read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So are, are we calling that that's our next review? I believe that's our next review. Which really fucking throws a wrench. I'm going to say <laughs> right now that I did a stupid thing. I did a stupid thing to get today, guys. And that was I started reading. <laughs> All right. So anybody who's been listening for the last few episodes knows that me and Livius both um, acquired copies of uh, Maxwell's Demon, which is the upcoming release by uh, Stephen Hall, uh, because we've been waiting like 15 years for the second book to be released by Stephen Hall. Um, and so I think that I was kind of in that mindset when um, the new Stephen Graham Jones book, My Heart is a Chainsaw, dropped on my, my doorstep. And I was like, let's just go for it. Or I might have been egged on by some of my temporary co-hosts. Um <laughs> possibly <laughs> i think i think jesse actually texted do it earlier today so um i got started reading my heart is a chainsaw which doesn't release until the end of august um and i'm so sucked in now that i've got 300 pages left so i've got that plus whatever jesse's book adds up to to read uh before next episode so i really kind of did it to myself um <laughs> But I got a lot of reading coming up, and um, all I'm going to say is the the my heart is a chainsaw. 
um, is great so far. It's just great. It's so good. All right. Um, I think that brings us uh, to the end of this episode. I'd like to thank uh, Misty for picking this book. And I'd like to thank both of you for joining us in this. I don't even know what the fuck just happened. I don't even know what to call it, but whatever, whatever that was that we just did around all the beautiful sinners. I am, I am very happy that I finally had um, a, a chance slash reason, whatever you want to call it to, to read it. It's been uh, a thorn in my side, I guess, that I've never read this book. So I'm I'm very glad that you picked it, Misty, genuinely. I'm glad. All right. Um, then uh, I will say good night to our uh, co-hosts. And uh, I guess next time you hear us, The People's Act of Love by James Meek. And until next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. It, it kind of even feels like we didn't even talk about the book somehow. I know. Right. <laughs> and you know what I realized as uh, at the very end of the wrap ups is we didn't even talk about all the names the towns are biblical. No, not at all. Nope. There. <laughs> nope. Didn't come up. <laughs> and there's that was, that was like one of the things that first stood out to me ten years ago. So that's Missy. cool. Missy. There's okay. about a million things that we did not mention. Uh, that's true. There's that's like, true. there's so many, like the the pose of the kids. Like, oh, we didn't talk about the pose. The the reason that the kids matter, like he didn't even have his own kids. There's so right. much. <laughs> sterile. Yeah. What's the one thing he can't do? Reproduce. Oh my god. I was even I was even thinking about things that we hadn't brought up yet during the during the episode like thinking if i can like fit them in and still didn't even get a chance like how rob had the disclaimer about indian versus native american i'm like well maybe we should because rob mentioned that jim doe gets into the truck with this high school girl maybe we should mention that he doesn't actually do anything bad or creepy it's just that she okay. reminds him of his sister who was so it's really fucking sad it was really sad yeah, and he's made out to be a creep about it, like we kind of yeah. did. Like, he's not into her at all. It's just, no, you're like my sister, and she's fucking gone. <laughs> yeah, there's so many. Uh, you like... know what, though? Hold on a second. Because <clears throat> at the end, when he comes back to the town, <clears throat> I, I got to think he's thinking about it. Because he even talks about how she's 18 now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, he's a man, uh, after all. I, well, you know. <laughs> Dude, the ending, though, like like the, the insurance man thing totally caught me by surprise. Yeah. Yep. That was fucking brilliant. Cause, Incredible. Like, it was one of those things that was set up so, like, <clears throat> basic in the beginning mm -hmm. that when it came back in the end, you're like, holy shit, I never thought of that. You know what else we never mentioned? That his sister was taken by the Tin Man. Yep. Jim Doe's yeah. sister. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, anybody who listened to the first 15 minutes of that and then decides they're going to go read the book will still have a couple surprises. Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's, what, that's why I was saying that Jim Doe, Jim Doe was supposed to be Amos Pease because Jim mm -hmm. Doe was supposed to have been taken with his sister. Mm -hmm. Right. But he wasn't. It was their childhood friend mm -hmm. who was all like was dirty from the, the storm and the chimney and shit. Yeah. Yep. But he didn't forget about him all those years later. He's like, it was supposed to be you, basically, right? Yeah. 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 Which also like goes into what you were saying about how you think that maybe the Tin Man just wanted a tidy story. So yeah, Jim Doe was the final piece to fill everything in. And um, wasn't there examples of kids that didn't match? So, like, there was one that was cousins, and because they were cousins, yeah. that didn't work. So, like, there's even, like, uh, he does what he can in the moment, but after the fact. Let me ask you this, then. Like the, yeah, the, it was the, the blue kettles, right? The blue kettles were cousins, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Who were... The prologue kids, was that just one example of a set of brother and sister? It wasn't anything that tied in later on, right? It was just like 
one of the one of the sets. See, timing wise, that could have been Micah. It, it would have been Micah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so she was the one that was all about father. Yep. I got you. Because yeah. right. she would have been eleven or twelve, and then by the time it hits ninety nine, yeah, she would, that's the right age for that. Yep. Okay. And the or, kids in eighty two was Jim Doe's sister. Mm-hmm. Yep. We didn't even talk about um, the what is it wigs and like the way that those were like those killings went down with like the fucking like letter pinned to the cheeks. The, oh, yeah, to the cheeks. Yeah, with the I'm number. I'm sorry, the yeah. number. Yeah. That that was really fucking weird, and how that came back later on, where there was the number pinned to the cheek because um, the FBI agent was was involved in this case. Now, oh man, Creed. Well, it's also that's the waitress that he kills that had yep. one of Wig's kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm. This is all getting tacked on post episode. I'm telling you because like it's just <laughs> like a like a it's just a dump of information. <laughs> Jesus, so much stuff happening in the story. It's fucking insane.